Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Lisa Burke. Um, I am a professor at the University of Melbourne's Department of Rural Health, located just across the river in Shepparton. Thank you all very much for coming tonight to share, learn and discuss the pressing mental health issues facing our community, facing our young people and directly impacting one in five Australians. To begin, it is important that we acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we on the land of which we meet on tonight. So I'd like to welcome Uncle Lance James, who will welcome us to country. Thank you for that. Welcome and good evening. First, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the First Nations peoples whose lands we meet on tonight. I pay my respects to our ancestors and our elders, both past and present, and other Aboriginal peoples in the room. I'd also like to acknowledge all of the members of the Stone Generations, those who have passed, those who have found their way home, and those who are still looking for their families. I'd also like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the forgotten Australians. The Order of Nations boundary started at Murchison and we share country with Tungarong, all the way up to Wangaratta. We continue on up to Wodonga, this side of the Murray River, up to Denaliquin, and up to this side of Swan Hill. Down to Wichuga and Kyabram and then to Murchison. First Nations people is made up of 16 family groups that form your Yord Nations. William Cooper, Ada Cooper, Robert Cooper, Elizabeth Atkinson, Jack Cooper, Jenny Charles, Maggie Stone Nelson, Baggett Morgan, Edgar Atkinson, Fred Walker, John Atkinson, Maggie Tulin Yagen, Tommy McRae, Annabelle Howard, and Alf Morgan. We have eight tribes Kalithaban, Walithika, Mora, Yalapna, Bangarang, Quat Quat, Yalaba Yalaba, Nora Ilam Wurong. Eighty years ago, through, uh, through bad management, through cruelty, 210 people walked off Kamragunja. We celebrated a walk-on in February this year. From those 210 people that walked off, today we number some 10,000. So not only have we survived, we've achieved quite a lot in that 80 years. We walk from Kamraganja to the flats in Marupna. Uh, we've set up uh, services that have been able to places like Rambalara um, and many other services to go with it. We have uh, not only have our people subject to all the humiliation and the racism, people like Jack Patton, Bill Ferguson, William Cooper, Sir Douglas Nichols, Thomas Shadrach James, were the people that inspired and allowed us to become what we are today. And we always acknowledge and thank them. Your the ordinations is now a powerful body within this right that provides and looks after land and country, looks after sacred sites, cares for um, the rivers when we can. When we're allowed to be uh, more involved in the rivers and the systems, then we, will, we know how to look after them. We've looked after them for 60,000 years. It's taken only 200 years to wipe the rivers out. Fire burning ceremonies we have that care for country. When we become acknowledged and accepted into broader mainstream that we can help because we've had 40,000 years 
our people have come through the Ice Age, so we know uh, what we're talking about. As we walk in the footsteps of our ancestors as First Nations people, I'd like to welcome you all to land and country. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle Lance, um, to you and your community for your welcome to this beautiful land, for sharing your cultural traditions, for your spirit of partnership in enhancing wellbeing, and for your patience with our cultural ways. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, all traditional owners and other First Nations people present here tonight. Welcome to you all to Breaking Down Stigma in Mental Health. This is one of the psych talks offered by Melbourne University School of Psychological Sciences in partnership with both us here in Shepparton, the Department of Rural Health, and also with the prominent body, SANE Australia. Psych Talks is the Melbourne School of Psychological Sciences forum for ideas and discussion, and we continue that tonight. We're truly delighted to have you all here on Are You OK Day, um, and it's very fitting um, to have this Psych Talk forum on this particular day. Um, now I'd like to hand over to the very capable Dr Chris Groot, who is the Director of the Mental Illness Stigma Lab and works in partnership with SANE Australia and the Anne Deveson Research Centre as research lead on its flagship study, the National Stigma Report Card. Chris teaches in areas of clinical psychology and psychological research methods and conducts research in areas of stigma, psychosis, suicide and mental health service delivery. Chris and his team have worked very hard to put tonight together and we thank them for coming to Country Victoria to offer Psych Talks. Please welcome Dr Chris Groot. Thank you very much, everyone. Oh, I really do have to be close to this microphone, don't I? And uh, thank you very much, uh, Lisa and uh, Uncle Lance, for that very warm welcome to Shepparton. Uh, we're very uh, excited to be here, and I might um, begin by giving a little bit of context, and that is that this is actually the second annual Psych Talk Stigma event, with last year's event being held on the eve of World Mental Health Day at Melbourne University in Melbourne. And we have intentionally come to Shepparton uh, today, not only because of the partnership with the School of Rural Health, but also in acknowledgement that Australia is a very diverse country geographically and in terms of its community. And we wanted to come out of the city and have an opportunity to speak with you all about how mental health um, stigma plays out in a setting outside of metropolitan centres as well and talk about some of the issues that are very relevant to um, Australia more broadly and to the Shepparton community. So I'm very excited to have my um, colleagues here joining uh, me on the panel this evening. Uh, firstly, to my right, we have uh, Alan Thorpe, who's the director and facilitator at Dadi Manwaro, which is um, an organisation that provides leadership and training programs uh, tailored to Indigenous men. Uh, next, we have Georgie Harmon, who is the CEO of Beyond Blue. I'm sure everybody's heard of Beyond Blue, an organisation that's done wonderful work in destigmatising and opening up discussions about anxiety and depression in particular. We've also uh, got Abdullah Naveed, who is representing the Ethnic Council of Shepparton and has been doing wonderful work in the region um, with um, refugees and migrants in the region around mental health. And certainly last but not least, we have the wonderful Dr. Michelle Blanchard, who is the Deputy CEO of SANE and Director of the Anne Deveson Research Centre. Uh, and does a lot of work around stigma about complex mental health issues such as psychosis and personality disorder and so forth. And so we have collaborated leading up to this evening's uh, event on a range of sort of topics we're going to touch on. 
and I'm going to wear dual hats as a speaker and as the moderator for the uh, event. We're additionally very um, much looking forward to hearing your thoughts and your comments and questions, but I'll ask you to hold those until the end of the panel discussion when we will open up to the room uh, for any questions or comments or discussions that you would like to have. I will firstly take a sip of water because my mouth is getting very dry already. I'll preface, um, I suppose, what's going to come up in discussion by acknowledging that uh, we are all very mindful that we're going to be discussing very sensitive themes, the idea of, of mental health issues and discussions around mental health issues are, are very uh, potentially sensitive and particularly um, mm -hmm. the idea of stigma about mental health issues can be an additionally sensitive topic and so we're very mindful of that and we will progress in a sensi sensitive manner as we have these discussions. Uh, if you do find uh, anything comes up for you in discussion, then please feel free to uh, come and see me after the event or afterwards you may like to call um, either the Beyond Blue info line, which is open 24-7, or the SANE Australia helpline, which is open until 10 p.m. So I'm going to begin just by defining um, a little, I suppose, the parameters of our discussion and what we mean when we talk about stigma about mental health issues or mental illness stigma, stigma about things like depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and so forth. When we think about or talk about stigma, there are a range of um, types of stigma that we might talk about, and I think tonight's discussion is going to focus on two of these things. One would be public stigma. So public stigma is said to be um, negative stereotypes and prejudicial emotions and discriminatory behaviours, generally socially distancing behaviours that might um, be um, exhibited by members of the general public towards um, people living with mental health issues. The flip side of this is self-stigma. So when we talk about self-stigma, this is driven primarily by an awareness of public stigma. We've all grown up, most of us in Australia, a country where historically mental health issues have been stigmatised and we're aware of those types of stereotypes um, which are generally misled. And because of this awareness, one may consider if one's having that experience that you know is stigmatised, you might consider that, um, for example, if uh, a, a a stereotype is that you're fundamentally flawed if you've got an experience of depression or anxiety, for example. You might, if you're aware of that, you might agree with it and think I am fundamentally flawed because I have that condition. And you can imagine then what that could do to yourself in terms of um, damage to self-esteem. If you were experiencing a condition like depression, for example, how that might compound your experience as well. And we know self-stigma is a real problem for people living with mental health issues. And in fact, maybe that's where we'll start our discussion. I think, Georgia, you've done, and Beyond Blue has done, an amazing uh, amount of work in terms of destigmatizing anxiety and depression. And I know you've got some really interesting insights into the experience of self-stigma around that. Would you like to maybe sure. share some of your insights? Sure. Um, thank you, Uncle Lance, for your beautiful welcome to country. It's lovely to be here. It's so good to be here tonight and get out of Melbourne. Um, <laughs> so I just want to start with what I think is probably the best description of, of stigma. And if you look up the dictionary definition of stigma, it uh, comes from the word stigmata, which is actually a stain, a stain on one's character. Um, 
so if we think about it in that way, what a horrible concept, what a horrible idea um, that someone would, would be perceived as being stained or blemished because of a condition that, you know, is like any other illness that we're all um, susceptible to. I've, I've not met one person in my career working in this field who has a blemished character um, because of a mental illness. So I just want to start by saying that. Um, we've done a lot of work in trying to tackle stigma and discrimination around the most common mental health conditions in Australia, which are depression and anxiety. About a million um, Australians experience depression every single year and about two million experience an anxiety condition or sometimes both. Um, We've made huge um, steps forward, I think, especially around uh, reducing social stigma, so the way that, as, as a community, we feel about these things. Um, but we're starting to get really worried. In fact, we've always been worried, but, but as we've moved social stigma, we haven't moved self-stigma as much as we want to. So, um, and that's what's holding people back from talking about this, letting their family, friends, loved ones, workplaces, colleagues know that they're struggling. Um, it's stopping them getting the help and support and treatment that would actually help them towards recovery. Um, so we've done a couple of really interesting pieces of research um, recently that we're now using to adapt how we tackle stigma at Beyond Blue. Um, and the first of those I want to tell you about is a national study that we did of police and emergency services workers around Australia. So 21,000 AMBOs, policemen and women, um, SES people, um, fireys, um, both current serving, retired and volunteer participated in a research study right around the country. We think it's probably the biggest study of its kind in the world. Um, so 21,000 men and women took part in this. Um, only 1% of people, of those 21,000 people, believed that having a mental health issue was that person's fault. Yet 61% of those people who participated in our study who had identified that they had lived with a mental health issue said, um, sorry, a third of them, so 33%, who lived with a mental health condition said that they felt ashamed. So we got 1% of you know, your mates and your colleagues saying, nothing to worry about, not your fault. But a third of, other, of people who actually live with a mental health condition saying, I feel really ashamed by this. 2%, um, only 2% of respondents said that they believed that if a colleague had depression or anxiety or any other mental health condition, that they would be a burden in the workplace. Yet 61% of, again, people who had disclosed through the survey that they had a mental health issue said that they would tell it somebody else. So there's a huge disparity there. One and two percent versus a third and two thirds of people holding themselves back because they really feared what other people would say. So that's with police and emergency services workers. Um, we also have done a, pop, uh, a sort of um, Australian-wide um, snapshot study of how people feel about anxiety because anxiety is the most common mental health condition in Australia. Um, and what we, what we, we wanted to, to discover what the general community felt about anxiety conditions and felt about other people um, who may have anxiety. 90% of Australians who responded to that survey said that they believed anxiety was a real illness. 86% said that they felt they, they knew that anxiety, if you had anxiety, it wasn't a sign of weakness, it wasn't a character flaw. 85% um, said you can't just snap out of anxiety. So again, massive numbers of people, the vast majority of people in the community who are starting to get that anxiety is real, that you can't just snap out of it, and it's nothing that, that's about you fundamentally as a person. Yet we know that people who live with anxiety conditions feel terribly ashamed. It takes one in, it takes on average six years for, for about 20% of people who live with anxiety to get help because they are so deep, they either don't know what's going on for them or they're so deeply ashamed of reaching out and, and getting help. So that is the thing that we're really interested in. It is the thing that's stopping people getting better um, and it's something that we're going to continue to really focus on. And I guess if I can sum it up in one line, what you're thinking isn't what they're thinking. So if you think about it like that. Mm. 
Thanks, Georgie. It's really interesting to hear those really common concerns of people with lived experience of depression and anxiety that maybe don't really represent the current trends in terms of the way that people are thinking about that experience. Michelle, what are some of the common concerns that you hear and Sane hears around more complex mental health issues? Yeah, it's a really good question, Chris. And I think um, you know, when we talk about complex mental health issues, we're talking about those that are a little bit less common than depression and anxiety. And I think you know, Georgie's done um, a really great job of, of highlighting that we've come a long way with respect to destigmatizing depression and anxiety, although there is still an enormous amount of work to be done around self-stigma. What we hear though from people who might experience illnesses like um, psychosis or, or personality disorder, um, eating disorders, is that they really don't feel like that public or social stigma has shifted. Um, and they use examples like um, media reporting around mental illness and violence as examples that have a very real impact on their day-to-day -day lives. And, you know, I think of an example of a woman um, who I worked really closely with for a couple of years who lives with schizophrenia. And every time we were in the office and there would be breaking news about a violent incident here or overseas, um, you could see her just getting smaller and smaller in her seat. Um, and, and when you had a conversation with her about what was going on for her, it was this sense that every time something like this happened, she knew that she would be treated just that little bit more differently from, from the people around her. Um, mental illness does not make you a violent person in, in any way, um, but unfortunately the way that we often report about these issues link mental illness and, and violence and extremism. And so these kinds of things still impact very readily on people's day-to-day -day lives. Um, people who experience complex mental health issues, and I, I say this as someone who experienced an eating disorder a lot earlier in my life um, still feel like um, they might be discriminated against when it comes to employment or educational opportunities um, in relationships with other people. You know, there's, and this ties into this self-stigma piece as well. You know, for people um, who are um, looking to start a family or looking to enter a relationship, having this real uncertainty about how safe it is to let somebody know what they've been through and what they've experienced and, and the fact that their brain might work a little bit differently than, than other people. So, you know, what we sort of see as being incredibly important is to take what we've learnt from all of the wonderful work that's been done in, in destigmatising these more common experiences that people might have um, and really translate that across into conversations about these more complex mental health conditions as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Michelle and I work in very similar areas. Most of my research is about stigma, about more complex mental health conditions as well. And um, I think um, it's safe to say that a, one of the focuses of our um, work we're doing at the moment is starting to explore some of those themes that you've been talking about, about the, the, the types of concerns that people with mental, uh, complex mental health issues might have, are experienced maybe in terms of stigma and, uh, well obviously stigma, but discrimination, social exclusion uh, is very, a very common behavioural outcome of stigma, distancing ourselves maybe um, from people who have a lived experience of um, mental illness or complex mental illness um, can be a very common concern and as a, res as a response, we know there can be a tendency to sort of withdraw and not put yourself out there to be rejected as much in the future if you've had an experience of being rejected and not 
it plays out in various ways. It can be very blatant or it can be very subtle, but you're aware of it. It could be a reduced degree of eye contact during a conversation, but nonetheless you're aware that there was an awkwardness there and an element of discrimination there in interpersonal contact. Um, and we know that isolation is um, dire for mental health generally, and I know, Abdullah, you have been doing um, some really great work with um, people in your community who do experience quite a degree of isolation. And we talked the other day about people who in your community are living with mental health issues, but the ability to, I suppose, seek support and to seek social support is um, impacted by issues like literacy, for example, and language issues. What are some of your observations there? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for uh, asking this uh, question, which is uh, a major issue in my community. Okay, you all know that uh, I am belong to a community uh, which uh, the war is going on from the 40 years, since 40 years, continuing till uh, today. The Afghan refugee started coming here uh, from, uh, mostly from 1999 in uh, 2000, uh, when the Taliban uh, took over all over Afghanistan. From that time, uh, continuously, I can say every year, the people uh, have flewed from Afghanistan, okay, from different ways they, they got here. Since, I'm, uh, uh, since I am here for the last four and a half years in Shepparton, at the beginning I was uh, seeing the people especially the individuals, the single people, those who are living without the family. I have seen a very uh, frustrated and loneliness people. They were isolated, absolutely. I have seen the people for uh, just, as you mentioned, the illiteracy. Illiteracy is the, the most uh, hardship for my community, even for a single uh, telephone message you're receiving from somewhere or a letter, they had to go door to door, they asking the people to read a message or a letter for them. But uh, when they received a letter or message today, in a week they were able to, to read the message and then to answer uh, the message or, for example, the, uh, to reply the letter, they were mentally suffering a lot and they were saying that, okay, from one side, the language barrier, most majority of them, I can say 85, 90% of the Afghan who are living here, they are uh, absolutely illiterate. Even they cannot read and write in their own language. Mm. Therefore, as we have uh, too many paperwork here in Australia, <laughs> then it was triggering the, the problem too much uh, to them. Mm. It was very difficult for them to go somewhere to find someone to read the letter or the message. Mm. Since I'm working uh, in ethnic council, okay, from the beginning I had enough experience about these people about their, uh, the factor of the, their mental health issues. I and uh, Ms. Angie from GV Health, from here we started uh, uh, mental health information session, like at the beginning, okay, just we simply introduced what is stigma, how to cope with the stigma, about the grieving loss, in many other uh, subjects, we were thinking that these people uh, may be held by these uh, subjects. Uh, from one side, okay, I can say uh, very briefly that uh, I have uh, 
about 10 uh, clients that five or six of them are from 65 to 75 years old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are absolutely illiterate and they are living here for the last uh, eight or nine years without the family. They are suffering from, from very uh, severe uh, mental health issues and also physical unhealthiness. Uh, okay, I try to help them in, uh, in various ways. Most of the time, I can say from early in the morning until I'm not going to the bed, uh, I am with them physically or okay by telephone when they are somewhere they are facing some problem. I interpret for them when they are, as an example, this morning, one of them called me from Banala. He had an uh, appointment with the eye doctors. He could not uh, read the letter which received a week before from the hospital. The doctor was too angry on, on him that he said, uh, I advised him how to use the drops, how to use the medication, but he did not do anything as I advised. It is the problem for mm. uh, the Afghan refugees, especially for those who are illiterate. Mm. It is a very big issue. It sounds like a really complicated um, issue of Abdullah, obviously language is a big issue. Very big issue, yeah. Especially, yeah. In, I mean, the mental health system, let's face it, is difficult for anyone to navigate in Australia, as you point out, yeah, yeah. Uh, a very paperwork-heavy system. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, I can hear that, that um, the literacy issue is yeah. um, even further complicated by yeah. a range of other cultural issues, not having social support from your family who's back in another country yeah. and are yeah. not here. Yeah. Uh, and so it really does set the scene for, for isolation and makes, I suppose, implementing a really effective mental health support network across the country for diverse communities yep. like the yep. Afghan yep. community yep. quite challenging. Yep. And Georgie, I know Beyond Blue has done a lot of work across Australia in um, raising discussions and awareness around mental health issues across diverse communities. What are some of the, the core challenges that you've had to uh, overcome in that process? Well, I think it's, I mean, I think Abdullah's, you know, of course he's right, he's, he's an expert, not like me. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it's about us imposing our westernised mm. views and concepts of, and words and, you know, the way that we think about these things on cultures that actually just are very different to us. Um, mm. So yeah. I think we've all, you know, we've got to learn from people like Abdullah to, to actually make our services mm. you know, um, better, um, but but look, I mean, I guess you know, it's language. It's I mean, uh, some cultures don't even have words mm -hmm. for suicide mm. or mm. mental illness or depression. Mm. Um, so it really is as basic as that sometimes. Um, mm. a, and to me, it really comes down to our biggest lesson, and you know, the the, the kind of lessons that we've learned along the way as we've worked with you know, culturally and linguistically diverse communities, with LGBTI communities, with r remote communities. Um, and I'm not saying that, like, Beyond Blue is not an expert in this stuff. We're, one thing I don't want my organisation to be is a seagull, you know, kind of flying in, doing a great big... Mm -hmm. and flying out again. Um, you know, we, we um, are, the way we like to work is to go in, um, attract money, um, and then fund services in local communities um, that are run by local service providers. So that's mm. the way that we like mm. to work. We're not experts. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. So in the Greater Dandenong region, um, which is one of the most multicultural areas in Victoria, um, there's a massive um, migrant community there and uh, some really big challenges. So we were approached to, um, to kind of develop a, a peer-led um, service. So what we did is we actually recruited about 12 different people from the community um, who had an interest in this area. They're not clinicians, they're not experts, they're just everyday people, but people who are passionate about their communities. 
Um, some of them were studying psychology or interested in the field, yeah. but we brought them in and we actually trained them up as peer workers. Um, and between them, they think I think they spoke 18 different languages or something. Um, and what the model was, it wasn't about clinical services, it was actually just about equipping these people to actually go back into their communities and say, hey, if you've got a problem, come and talk to me, or to actually go and seek people out. Um, and uh, so part of their role was actually about you know, having those conversations with their, um, with their peers and with their communities, identifying when something wasn't quite right, talking to that person about it, and then helping them connect to services or supports. Um, so we, we trialled that for about 18 months. It worked, we had it evaluated, and it, you know, when that, that was a really positive evaluation. People loved it, in particular found it very useful, and their levels of psychological well-being improved. Um, so we, we, um, we then handed that model over to the local service provider, um, because it's now their job to actually make sure that it, you know, it sticks in their community. So that's an example <coughs> of the way that we work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. So really embracing the, the strengths and the expertise of the local yep. people who are embedded in yeah. the community and really know those issues at a grassroots level. Exactly. Um, yeah. I think, um, and while we're talking about this in the context of mental illness, it's so important for us to really embrace the knowledge and the skill set and the wisdom that comes from lived experience. Um, and uh, you just made me think about a program that we've rolled out at Melbourne University in our psychology curriculum this year in partnership with uh, SANE and the DAC Centre, which um, is a centre that houses the Cunningham DAX art collection, which is a collection of works produced by people with lived experience of mental health issues over time. And our students have, for the first time, benefited uh, from an enriched curriculum this year that uh, has been co-created with people with lived experience. They've had a benefit of going to the centre and learning from the art and speaking with the artists, from hearing directly from people with lived experience of a range of mental health issues and actually having live stream conversations with those people as well. Um, and it's just gone, it's added so much value to our curriculum. Our evaluations actually demonstrated um, that we've seen reductions in stigma in the students as well. Uh, and in fact, it's confounded my other research projects to a point where I've had to statistically control for this and that my other research projects that have run concurrently that the students have um, participated in, when we look at the point at which they started that program, we see the scores have dropped after that. Um, so um, I think lived experience just gives that, that very rich picture, that real picture of what mental health <coughs> issues are that academics, for example, just cannot bring to the table if they don't have lived experience. I personally do. I experienced quite severe panic symptoms back around 2011, 2012, and had some real issues with anxiety there for a period of time. And I still know that I've got the potential to have those experiences again, so I need to be um, mindful of how I set my particularly working life up to be able to manage my work without triggering anxiety. Um, and so in my lectures, I can contextualise that little bit of my lecture series, but other things that I don't have personal experience of, it's really great to be able to uh, draw on other people to, who do have that lived experience to give their insights and that value, because it's just such a complex issue that we're talking about. And we've talked about uh, the complexities of literacy. We've talked about how this plays out um, differently in terms of mental health stigma for um, different types of mental health issues and um, Alan we're very lucky to have you along as well to share with us um, how you're working with mental health stigma and mental health generally with Aboriginal men in the region certainly as I was listening to Uncle Lance I was thinking about everything that's come with colonialization for Aboriginal Australians and um, how much intergenerational trauma there is. And I know you do a lot of work around trauma, don't you, with your 
services. Do you maybe want to share a little bit about the, the type of work that you do with Dadi Monwaro and um, Monwaro? I didn't pronounce that very well, did I? Uh, and how you, I suppose, create a safe space for men to be able to talk about mental health issues. Sure. I just want to also pay my respects to Uncle Lance and thank you for the welcome. Um, yeah, it's a privilege to be here and it's a really complex issue, isn't it? Like the complexity is of mental health and um, I suppose from an Aboriginal perspective, you know, thinking about intergenerational trauma, oppression, um, you know, the pressures of society in general. Um, but the things that I, I sort of think about mental health, I think about, you know, being inadequate, um, you know, self-worth, um, you know, all them really strong messages that really oppress us and hurt us in spirit. I'm no academic, um, mm -hmm. but I have a lot of life experience and I've had a lot of, I've been really fortunate enough to work in the Aboriginal community, working particularly with men and, and not only providing a safe space, but actually learning a lot um, over 20 years. Um, I, th I suppose I was attracted to it because, a bit like Chris, you know, um, footy was probably a big part of me. It sort of suppressed me in lots of ways. It really wasn't who I am. Um, and so my transition was really big as well. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really glad we've got role models out there like Wayne Swass and, and other mm. people really promoting and giving permission to... Uh, and, and role models are really important to do that, to give permission for others to actually just say it's okay to talk about it and own it and, uh, and, and deal with it. So I'm really, we're really glad, we're, we're sort of lucky to have good people like that in community who are prepared to sort of yeah. share their, their experiences. And um, so I, I like working with transformation. I, I'm really big, you know, it, trauma is a really big thing in Aboriginal community. And I, I'm really interested in working in a really safe environment where we can share story but we can heal some of that. So, um, you know, the things we hide, repress and deny about ourselves, the, the things we don't want people to know, I think it's really internal work. I think sometimes you can't control what's out there and that can impact on your mental health. But, you know, instead of trying to control what's out there, we can only heal ourselves. So I think we, look, we do a lot of work internally, mental and spiritual. So we're really lucky... Um, you know, uh, so a lot of our work is creating safe spaces through, you know, really connecting back to uh, the elements. And, and connecting is really important because, you know, mental health can really uh, disconnect you. I think society, I think we, we sort of operate from a real physical and intellectual space and we're not really giving each other permission to actually connect as people. And, and feel each other's hearts so, and, and deal with our emotional parts of ourselves. So until we do that, we're not going to see a real big change. But, you know, connection's everything. That gives you a sense of belonging, gives you connection, and you sometimes have to take that Ned Kelly suit off and become a bit vulnerable in that. So that's all we really do in our space. So, yeah, just want to... So it sounds like you've been doing some wonderful work in that space with, uh, with Aboriginal men. Uh, there, Alan, and it's wonderful to hear that you've been uh, doing that work. And I'm going to come back to you with another question in time. You've raised a question for me. I'm wondering, um, we've just been talking about the work that you do there in terms of interventions for mental health issues and stigma about um, mental health issues. Michelle, I'm wondering in terms of interventions for um, complex mental health issues, what do we need to know more about to inform those sorts of interventions, I suppose, at a very grand scale, at a large national scale? Yeah. Um, so I think the first thing is when we talk about interventions in this space, um, some of the things that actually work the best are empathy and compassion. Mm both for yourself but also for the people around you. So it sort of it sounds like there's going to be some magical 12-week program that we can deliver somewhere that's going to reduce stigma forever. Um, and it's not the case. It, it's about um, having these conversations and, and telling these stories. Um, but in terms of what we need to know around um, understanding the experience of people affected by complex mental health issues um, is... I guess twofold. So, so one is around understanding 
the impact that existing stigma reduction work has had. Um, and an example I'd use there is um, one of the ideas that was really common um, in the early days of SANE as an organisation was to help people understand that schizophrenia was a really complex neuropsychiatric condition. And that meant that the um, experiences that people had, whether that was hearing voices or seeing things that weren't really there, um, were completely beyond the control of the individual. And on one hand, that's a really positive message um, because it helps us to see that um, the person's experiences and behaviours are not the whole person. Um, it's a symptom. But the unfortunate byproduct of that is people may then see that the person's behaviour is completely beyond their control, which means that if we don't know the person, if we don't have empathy for them and, and um, we don't know who they really are, we might think that people are unpredictable or that we can't trust them. And so something that was actually relatively well-meaning, like helping people understand what might be going on in someone's brain, possibly didn't have the impact that we were hoping it would have. So I think we need to understand those kinds of things a little bit better. Um, but I think we also need to understand um, the true scale of, of the experiences that people have. And so one of the things that Chris and I and, and our team have been working on is developing up a, a national report card on the experiences of stigma and discrimination by people living with these complex mental health concerns. We're going to go out over the next three months and, and speak to 7,000 Australians um, right across the country, as far away as Broome and Bunbury in WA, um, right through to, to Tasmania and up in Darwin and Townsville, um, and hear about how mental health stigma impacts people's lives, whether that's in housing, education, employment, in their interpersonal relationships when they go online. Um, because we actually don't have that data in Australia beyond mm. depression, anxiety, and a little bit around schizophrenia. Mm. Um, so it's an enormous um, opportunity for us to really understand people's lived experience a lot better. Um, so that we can think about the kinds of settings where we need to have these conversations about stigma um, and build that, that empathy and, and understanding of people's experiences. Mm, absolutely. Um, so I just wanted to pick up on something that you opened uh, up with there um, when you were talking about hearing from people with um, um, mental health issues about their mm. experience. And I think that's so... Um, important certainly when we look at the research and we think about what works to reduce stigma about mental health issues that educational route is one thing but another thing that's really successful is actually just spending time with somebody that has um, experienced mental health issues and I would suggest that probably everybody in this room at some point in time has experienced some degree, even fleeting, of a mental health issue. Just like a physical health issue, like a cold that may come and go at the very least. We generally, somewhere in our lives, have experienced stress, feeling stressed out, for example, or down, even for brief periods of time. And for some of us, we've had more profound experiences um, and just entertaining that idea subverts the, the main mechanism that uh, gives rise to stigma which is a dichotomous way of thinking us and them you have it or you don't it's not generally the reality we've um, got it a little bit or what got it we experience mental health issues generally over time more or less and it varies across all of us and when we open up these sorts of discussions and we can share these experiences it just gives us insight into um, I think the reality, which is if you were speaking with somebody that had experience of schizophrenia, they would be able to demonstrate just through their interaction with you that they're not uncontrollable, for example, and subvert those types of stereotypes. 
Now, I want to take a little bit of a diversion now and check in with you, Abdullah, again. And one of the central themes that we're trying to draw out tonight is the complexity of this problem of mental health uh, stigma and intersections with things like ethnicity. Um, age came up before, and I wanted to ask you about um, gender as well, Abdullah. When we were talking the other day, you were mentioning that um, men in your community had some particular sensitivities around maybe um, help seeking and help seeking from maybe a female doctor? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, generally in my community, okay, I believe stigma is stigma existing everywhere in every society in every uh, community but it is more significant in uh, afghan community uh, since i am uh, involving with uh, with the people i have seen a lot of uh, them that yes they they try for example to keep their uh, sickness, their uh, pain, their uh, hardship with him or with her, but they cannot go, for example, to even to his GP or even to, to share the problem with someone else until they are uh, suffering too much. Mm. Yes, I remember that some days before uh, on telephone I mentioned a case that uh, Ms. Angie knows very well about one of our uh, client. He was suffering from severe pain day and night, but he was not able. He was hesitating to tell even to me that I was very close to him. And uh, all the time he trusted me to, to share every problem, mostly once a day or for example three or four times a week he was coming to my office and uh, sharing the problem he was facing the night before but he kept the problem for more than a week until he was uh, too much in problem finally he shared the problem with me and uh, we discussed between uh, two three organization and uh, Finally, we decided, okay, if you cannot go to your GP, I will go with you and I will uh, tell all the problem to your GP. Still, he was uh, hesitating. He said, okay, I can wait one or two days more. Uh, therefore, yes, even for the male, it is a problem, but for the female, it is, it is much more serious. Uh, they cannot go, for example, the female cannot go to a male doctor, or especially for some uh, uh, female issues, they keep the problem, but they cannot go to a male doctor. And does that extend to mental health issues as well? I Females think, in yes. the Afghan community think, might be reluctant yeah, to see I a male think, doctor. Yes. Also, traditionally, yeah. Uh, they have been used to, uh, and they never gone, maybe they never visited a male doctor in their home country. Uh, but here is still they are, uh, mentally they are there. If they are physically here, but their mental is okay. still they are, uh, as they have been used, is still they keep that uh, tradition with them. And is that they because of dare, this, for example. Is there a shame attached to uh, a shame or uh, I can say a stigma can play a significant role here. Mm. Even I heard that a female patient was visited by a male doctor, the other female of the community was spreading the news, uh, spreading the rumor that that girl or that woman went to a male doctor. She was uh, checked up by the male doctor. Okay. And uh, 
Yes, many factors are uh, involved here. Uh, yeah, some really complicated yeah, cultural yeah, complicated, issues there yeah, as, yeah. as well. And I yeah. know Shetland's a very multicultural community, yeah. so I can only yeah. imagine how complex yeah. uh, that could be. Um, so much of what we're talking about is based on misconception, and I think both Georgie and, uh, in fact, I think everybody has talked this evening about the idea of misled stereotypes about and the experience of mental health issues or mental illness. Um, we know that these have endured um, for some disorders or some experiences more than others. For example, there's some really interesting literature that goes back to the 1950s and um, there's been follow-ups on this project from the 1950s looking at attitudes to experiences like depression and schizophrenia and it was repeated in the 80s, 90s, the early 2000s, and more recently as well. And what you see over time is that the trend uh, in terms of attitudes towards depression has improved. Um, but in fact, the trend in terms of attitudes about schizophrenia, and particularly around uh, the perception of violence and fearfulness, has actually become worse since the 1950s. Um, we know, well, there is a theory and we've got some emerging experimental evidence that suggests that um, popular cultural works like um, movies and so forth, Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, etc., etc., give this idea that psychotic disorders and experiences are inherently violent experiences. We know there's a systematic um, bias towards pairing schizophrenia with violent crime in news reporting and when presented in a very decontextualized and simple way we latch on to that and we can't help but be influenced by that association. So these are myths and they're misconceptions um, and Alan I'm wondering in um, the group of young people that you work with around mental health issues have you picked up on any types of themes, any common misconceptions or myths or particular concerns that people might have, beliefs that people, young people might have? Mm. Social media and TV can play a bit of a role in that, eh? Mm. I think young people are really like building their identity. And it's so important for young people to feel safe and, and, and build their own identity and self-worth of who they really are. And I think we don't do enough work, um, particularly young, um, working with young Aboriginal men who are so hungry to be with role models. Um, and actually, men, men probably can be. Because I think the thing with particularly young people, if they've had a, a pretty poor start and they haven't had the, the support they need and the nurturing they need as young people, they... Um, they're just trying to. I, th I think that's a that's a real it's a, a risk for a young person, um, and I think so. One of the things is is about who can who can who can their role models can be, you know, because we can't all be superstars. Um, but you know, there's a lot of people in community who can actually impact on young people, and and that expressiveness and that vulnerability that they actually see men, because if they haven't had the father, the message is who cares. Or well, if they haven't had the mother, who cares? So the messages these young kids get, well, who cares? Who can I be? And I think they're looking for things, they're hungry for things, and they're trying to build this identity. And it's really prevention work. I think if we could, as a society, really support, you know, not everyone's fortunate enough to have a mother or father, but as a society, how do we embrace, not just through sporting clubs, or, you know, if you're not smart at school, it's like if you're not educated, where do these young people turn to? Because really all they want to do is just be themselves. Mm. Um, and what, does society allow that? Do we really allow and give permission to actually build their identity? Because as men uh, and women, I think if we can't be ourselves, mm. like we become somebody, and that's not who we really are. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think it's if we can get that message into young people, um, it's the most significant part of the journey and, it's, and society can play a role in that because if we don't, they'll be looking for things on TV or social media. So we have a responsibility as society to make sure we take, take our time for a young person yeah. because we don't know what they've gone through. And it might be that conversation for that young person could make the difference 
it's that self worth they get. Yeah. It's actually, yeah. I feel I'm, I'm, someone's actually seen me. Someone's actually taken the time to listen. So I think that's, you know, we've got so much work to do out there in society to actually take, take, uh, take care of our younger generation. I really agree with you there, Alan. I um, think it's amazing that we now have organisations like yours uh, and like Headspace helping young people in rural communities like Shepparton, but you know, from my experience having lived in a rural community previously, um, services were quite sparse for young people and just generally mental health services um, more broadly uh, and getting access to treatment or support was inherently difficult and I think there is uh, a strong role for the community to play. There's certainly an ongoing conversation at the moment around the capacity of the mental health system um, and that maybe we need to think about a way in which we can more effectively empower each other and the community generally to be able to make contributions to our own well-being and looking <coughs> after each other. And Are You OK Day is a great example of a way to get us to start thinking about that. And on this issue of limited services and living in rural areas, uh, Michelle, I'm wondering, mm. what are your um, sort of thoughts or recommendations, I suppose, for people who do live in rural, regional, or remote areas of Australia who might be needing access to support um, what would you recommend for those people? Yeah, um, I think you know one of the really interesting things about rural and regional communities um, is their enormous strengths. And you know, my my partner and and my parents-in-law um, grew up in rural and regional Victoria. And when I think about the characteristics of of them as a family, um, they're really community-minded. They know everybody. Um, they they put others first, potentially at the expense of themselves and their their own health and well-being. Um, and they're incredibly self-reliant. And I think um, you know there is a really important <laughs> opportunity here to be thinking about how we enhance the strengths of communities and draw on um, those community networks and and the sporting clubs and the community groups that get together and, and really wrap around people and, and provide that kind of help and support. Mental health care doesn't need to happen in a hospital or in a mental health service. Um, and I, I think you're really seeing our communities as places that can care for and support um, people is really important. Um, but also to um, acknowledge that there are other places where people might be able to go to access help and support as well. Um, you know, both Beyond Blue and SANE um, operate helplines where people can ring and they can ask questions and find out information and, and receive referrals to, to services um, or, or an understanding of how services might be able to assist. Um, and I think one of the other um, opportunities of, of these online and, and telephone support services is the way that they can connect people across geographic barriers. So one of the things that SANE has operated over the last um, five years is an online peer support forum for people who are affected by complex mental health issues and their family, friends and, and supporters. Beyond Blue also has a really fantastic online community um, for people who are affected by depression, anxiety or, or suicide. And these are places where people are able to share their stories and share their experiences to find out what might have been helpful for somebody else. Um, and probably one of the most powerful pieces of feedback that we've received about our online forums um, came from a family who was supporting a daughter living in a rural community. Um, and she'd been diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. And the, this young woman had spent a period of time uh, in hospital. And her parents wrote to us and said that 
you know, they had learnt more in 20 minutes of reading other people's stories online um, than they had with all of the medical and other supports that had been offered to them over that period. It was just hearing from others who'd been there before them um, and getting some ideas about how they managed that situation that, that were most powerful and, and most helpful for them. So we're really stronger as a community, aren't we? And I think today's again a perfect reminder that we can be empowered as a community to have these discussions and support each other but actually having that discussion that's a bit of a um, potentially quite a confronting and frightening prospect I think if you've never actually asked somebody about how they're doing. Um, Georgie what are your thoughts on how somebody could approach a discussion checking in with somebody about how they're they're doing? So, I've worked in this field, I, I've got no qualifications in mental health, right? I, most days I have no idea what I'm doing, but I employ really smart people who do. Um, and I think it's pretty simple. Um, it's don't try and sound like someone that you're not. Don't try and be someone that you're not. You don't need to have the words perfectly. Just trust your guts and <coughs> ask a question. And the are you okay question is a really good place to start. But what's really important is that you're ready for a response when someone says, no, I'm not. Um, and what do you do then? Um, you can say, okay, tell me about it. And then you just sit and listen. And sometimes you might just want to ask probing questions like, so why did you think you felt that way? Or um, did you do anything about that? Or do you think you might want to do something about that? How can I help you? Um, don't, for, don't, saying things like, um, but you've got so much going for you. You've got a great family. You've got a fantastic job. All of these things, these kinds of questions, as well-meaning and as, as rational as they might be, are incredibly unhelpful for someone who's actually feeling like they're worthless or feeling potentially like their family and the world is better off without them. So um, find your own, don't, don't, don't use anybody else's voice but your, your own. Um, check in with someone, are you okay? If, be prepared for the answer to be say, say no. Also be prepared for someone to say, it's none of your business, bugger off, um, which is actually quite common as well. Uh, and the way I, think about this and it you know it's worked for me a few times is okay just leave them alone don't push it but come back maybe a few hours later or come back a few days later and and use concrete examples of why you think you you're worried about them you know what have you noticed in in, in changes about them you know have they stopped coming to footy um you know have, have they been speaking about themselves in in a really down way little things that um that we can all spot um, but we don't necessarily link back to a mental health challenge. So persistence is also the key. Um, and just going round to, to that issue of services, um, every single day I meet people who are in recovery. They've been in the darkest of places and they've come back. And they've come back through a whole range of reasons because they've, you know, their family and their friends and their workplaces and have wrapped around them because they've got a great GP, hopefully, um, and because they've you know used a combination of online forums or you know more traditional mental health services. Um, but the, every single one of those people, it started with a conversation. Yeah. It started with someone saying, "I'm worried about you," or it started with that person taking that really brave step to say, "Actually, I don't think I'm right. Can I talk to you about it?" So trust your guts open your mouth and then close this and switch these on. Mm, fantastic advice. Um, I'm aware that time is ticking on and so I'm going to ask our panel members just one more question so that we've got time to open up to your questions and comments and have that discussion as well. Um, and I just wanted to pick up on something you made then around, uh, a, a point you made then, Georgie, around observations that we could have of other people and maybe if they've withdrawn in some way and you mentioned football and Alan, I know you've done a lot of work around football. Um, um, maybe if somebody withdrew from going to practice, you know, and so forth, you might check in with them, for example, and see how they're going. 
What sorts of, what is it that something like football and team-based, I suppose, sport like football um, does for mental health? What, what are, how does that support mental health? Well, it can build your self-esteem. I think footy and sport gives you self-esteem, self-worth. You know, you're in part a sense of belonging. Um, it's a good platform, I think, sport in general. Football, I played footy, so, but I tell yeah. you, the, I was shocking. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't any good. But I tell you, what I, what I did learn about playing footy is it depends on the culture you're in. And, and footy for me was, you know, it's a different era now. Like I'm showing my age now, but, um, but it was a different era. I think footy clubs are a lot better in educating mm. and having the conversation, but there's still a long way to go. Now, I think about footy is not sustainable, like sport's not sustainable, because at some stage of your life you have to give it up, and then who do you have? Mm -hmm. And that's what I've, I think a lot of footballers, particularly like mm. if they've built their identity, as they say, whatever goes up has to come back down, and that can be your ego. Mm. And, and so that can actually hurt you. So if you can actually ground and transition in any, any part of our journeys, I think uh, it, whether it's work, whether it's retirement, uh, doesn't matter what it is, transitions, we're always transitioning in whatever we do. I think footy is a good platform um, to provide that, particularly if we could get that message in young people. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, having role models. Um, but I think, yeah, like there's a lot of people suffering in sporting clubs <coughs> and don't really give themselves permission. So we've got to do better. Uh, but I, I'm big on transitions. I think transitions yeah. for me is about life journey and, um, you know, how do we look after ourselves and, and create them spaces for ourselves to actually transition. And so uh, that's, yeah. Mm, positive change. Positive the change. The the game, yeah. <laughs> that's right. So, folks, before we um, so open up to the group for questions and uh, and discussion, would you please join me in thanking our panel members for uh, their contributions this evening. <laughs>